Hi there, my name is Vic Veer. I'm an ENT consultant surgeon working for the NHS at the Royal National ENT Hospital in Central London and also at Queen's Hospital in Romford, Essex. Today I'm going to tell you all about drug-induced sleep endoscopy. So drug-induced sleep endoscopy is also known as DICE if you're American, uh, but I call it DSE because I'm still in denial about Brexit and I just want to feel slightly more European. So DSE is a technique or a test investigation that I use to work out which operation I should perform on someone who has snoring and sleep apnea problems. You see, if I see someone in my clinic uh, like this, uh, I look at the back of their throat and I can see different areas of their throat which may be bigger or smaller in different people. But it doesn't really tell me where their snoring or their sleep apnea is coming from. Because at the time, in clinic, whilst you're awake, you're not snoring, you're not stopping breathing. And so what I need to do is try and get them into a situation where they are snoring, where they are stopping breathing with their sleep apnea. So what I do is I lie them down on the bed, give them a tiny bit of sedation, enough for them to just fall asleep and snore in front of me. And then I put a telescope into their nose, wait there and wait for the correct state where they're actually sleeping. And then look at the back of their throat and see where the problem is coming from. Because everyone has a different, different area from where they snore or they have sleep apnea from. We don't all have the same problem. It's the same thing with uh, a blocked nose or bad hearing. Everyone has different problems. And the same thing happens with snoring and sleep apnea. So in this video, I'm going to explain what this uh, technique is and uh, why we need it. And then I'm going to tell you what the problems are with this technique and the traditional um, criticisms they are, particularly in this country, about DSA. And lastly, I'll tell you about a new technique I have for drug-induced sleep endoscopy and how it answers a lot of those criticisms. And hopefully, more people will start doing it and more people, in this country particularly, will start treating people with snoring and sleep apnea problems. So the reason why we need DSA is that uh, we need to work out where in your throat the problem is. Um, if you have CPAP or mandibular advancement device, these are other uh, things you can use for snoring sleep apnea. They're the first line things that you should try because there's no real risk with those. Uh, but the idea behind surgery is that you need to know the location of the problem. A sleep study only tells you how bad you are. It doesn't tell you where the problem is. Uh, with CPAP, you just blow air into your throat, everything opens up. You don't need to worry about where the problem is. But for surgery, because there are so many different types of surgery, you can't do them all on one person. Uh, everyone would go mad if I try to do 40 operations on one person. The idea is to pick out the right operation for each person. But knowing exactly where the problem is, that makes my diagnosis more accurate, finds a location better, and therefore I can give better treatment to my patients. So drug-induced sleep endoscopy, or DSA, was first invented at the Royal National ENT Hospital. Uh, actually, back then, Croft and Pringle invented it in the Royal National Throat, Nose and Ear Hospital. We've just recently moved to the Euston area. Now, what they did was, in the past, uh, we used to stand over a patient with one of these telescopes in their nose, and they'd be lying on the bed, and with the patient, with the doctor hanging over them like this with this telescope, we would wait for patients to start falling asleep. And when they fell asleep, we'd examine the back of their throat and try not to move, try not to wake them up. Uh, that worked very well, but as you can imagine, it's not particularly efficient. We can only possibly do maybe one or two people on each night. Uh, and a lot of people just can't sleep with, with this enormous wire in their nose. Um, and it's quite hard to, to, once they do fall asleep, not to move. Uh, and that's a bit of a skill about it. Just waiting for them to fall asleep was the hard bit. You had to wait sometimes an hour holding this telescope in someone's nose, trying to make small talk. Croft and Pringle came up with this idea of using sedative drugs or types of anaesthetic to make people fall asleep, and then they could look at the back of their throat. So we're using these drugs, these anaesthetics, these sedation drugs, to induce them to fall asleep. So they fall asleep in front of us and then we look with the telescope to see what's going on at their back, on the back of their throat. If you think about it, there are some obvious problems that can happen with this uh, technique. The first thing is, is this real sleep? If you're using an anaesthetic or a sedative to try and get people to sleep, is what you're seeing in the throat the same as when they are actually sleeping at home in their own beds? 
And because of this criticism, lots of people have been looking at different drugs uh, to try and work out which will give you the most realistic type of sleep, gets you in the state that's most akin to when you're naturally sleeping at home. So we can examine it and get the best accurate data for us. So there are lots of different techniques to doing DSA, but most people around the world would consider using a infusion of propofol. Propofol is an anaesthetic drug. Personally, I still don't think this is real sleep, and I don't particularly like that technique because, as I said, we're not sure if that's real sleep or not. But the other thing I don't like about propofol is that if you're clever enough, you can give propofol at the right level to make anyone snore. It's quite easy, uh, or anyone to start obstructing, because you just give the right level when the tongue falls back. So for the last five years, I've been working on this uh, new technique which is to look at a way of avoiding this problem with propofol. And the way I worked it out is understanding two different things. Firstly, I know that if you were able to let someone fall asleep with one of these telescopes in their nose, and as long as you keep still, they carry on sleeping. You might have seen some people with a, a tube that comes out here and they, they feed themselves through that. So it's quite, you're quite capable of sleeping with a telescope or, or a tube into your nose. And the second thing I knew was that there's a test that we do in sleep medicine where we take people, put them into a room in the middle of the afternoon, a quiet, dark, comfortable room with a bed. And within 20 minutes, most people just fall asleep. A lot of people think they can't sleep in the afternoon, but most people can. And the last thing I knew was that propofol, that drug that is given in the normal uh, technique, it lasts a very short time in the body. That's why you have to give it as an infusion. It works constantly. If you just give one shot of it, it lasts for about 5, 10, sometimes 15 minutes in the body before the clinical effects, the effects on you staying awake or asleep, come out of your system. What I do is I use uh, one shot of propofol. I don't give anything more. I don't give any boluses afterwards. I just give one shot of propofol, enough for the patient to fall asleep or be anesthetized or half anesthetized. At that point, you can put the telescope in because they're not going to move because they've had an, uh, like a, a light anaesthetic. And all I do at that point there is wait. And I wait there until I'm sure that the effect of the propofol has worn off. Sometimes it takes me 10 minutes just standing there. Sometimes it takes 15, sometimes it only takes five minutes. So whilst this propofol is wearing off, what I do is I turn off all the lights and keep the room as quiet as possible. No one's allowed to cough, speak, etc because once that propofol has worn off, they're no longer anaesthetized. As long as you're in a quiet, dark room, like before, you'll just carry on sleeping. And I've sat there for half an hour when you're given a small dose of propofol, clearly the, the effect has worn off. As long as I can keep still, I can look at the back of the throat and watch what's going on there. And you just want them to come out of the propofol effect and carry on sleeping afterwards. And it's that point where they're just sleeping afterwards that is what you want to try and uh, capture. So what I normally do is once I've recorded what I need to record from the back of the throat, just to prove to myself I've got this right, I gently call out to the patient or I nudge them a little bit. And normally they go, oh, sorry. Uh, and they wake up suddenly and they say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to fall asleep. That's the sort of general reaction. It happened today, in fact. Um, and the idea is that to me, that seems more representative of real sleep, if they can actually wake up and sit up and go, oh, I'm so sorry I fell asleep. And then they realize where they are and what they're doing there. And they go, oh, right, did it work all right? That sort of thing. And um, they're a little bit embarrassed. But to me, that feels like real sleep rather than sedation where you can put this tube in and out and they don't really move. So the main problem, uh, one of the main problems of this technique is that it takes much longer than uh, the old technique where you use an infusion of propofol. Uh, sometimes uh, you can go on for 10 minutes and you think you're at the right level and then someone walks into the theatre or someone coughs and wakes up the patient and you have to start all over again. Another problem is that it's much, much harder to do. Trying to keep still and looking at the back of the throat. The first bit, as I said, you can go in there and it doesn't wake them up because you're, you're under a little light uh, anesthetic. But once the propofol starts wearing off, you need to keep deathly still so you don't wake up the patient. Um, what does encourage me also is that some people do wake up saying, oh, I had a dream just then, because you can't really have dreams with a propofol. Whereas if you're having a real sleep, you do dream. Uh, and that to me feels like, oh, 
this sounds like it really is real sleep. Um, obviously, you've just had an anaesthetic or, or a very small dose of anaesthetic, so it's not going to convince everyone. But I think this is the closest we can get to real sleep. So even though there are uh, pros and cons to this technique, I think if you're going to do a big operation on someone, uh, potentially a very large operation, and you're deciding on which operation, which part of the throat to operate on, uh, I'd like the, this test that tells you what to do to be as accurate as possible. Perhaps one day I'll put a more detailed way of actually doing this technique so you can see exactly how it works and how quick, carefully you have to be, how, how still you need to be, how long you have to wait for some people. Um, if it helps, uh, I give approximately two milligrams per kilo of propofol at the very start. I pre-oxygenate, I uh, keep the ox oxygen on whilst the telescope is in place. I give them jaw thrust if they've gone a little bit too low. Uh, just to try and keep it as safe as possible. I don't like watching anyone go hypoxic. I know they might go hypoxic normally at home, but it's not something I like doing uh, in theatre. Uh, I don't think it's right. There's no need for them to become hypoxic. So I keep the oxygen going. I never let their stats go too low. And that way, I think it's safer than the old technique where you're just watching people doing what they normally do at home. So as I've said, over the last five years, I've been looking at um, bringing out this technique making it more accessible to people. Uh, what's encouraged me a lot is that my uh, three main anaesthetists, Jim Roberts, uh, Michael Gahuni, uh, Pete Thomas, all excellent anaesthetists at our um, institution at the Royal National ENT Hospital in London. Uh, they've helped me create this, they're fantastic doctors, and they've started spreading the word, telling other people about this new technique, which I think is an excellent way uh, of spreading the word. If other people uh, look at this technique and say, yeah, this is a much better technique and much more representative of real sleep, uh, that makes me feel better. But also, if other people are taking it on and saying, yes, I agree, this is a better way of doing it, I, I feel encouraged that this is the right thing to do. So I'm hoping that this technique will be uh, more palatable to the people, particularly in this country, who don't like the idea of DSE. Uh, a lot of the criticism is that it's not real sleep. I'm hoping that this will encourage people to think that actually there is a way around that uh, because we invented this technique and the rest of the world have taken off that you can't do a trial now on sleep surgery uh, around the world without doing a DSA first. It's only England that seems to be a couple of steps behind. I'd like to bring us back into doing this and being in the forefront in this sort of research. So this is the end of the video. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please like and subscribe to this channel. I'm sorry about the Christmas jumper if it's not December uh, when you're watching this. I just love Christmas. Uh, and if you have any comments, please do leave them below. I'll get through them one by one and I'll try and leave some uh, papers or links to the papers in the description so you can have a look at this a bit more detail. Please do contact me if you want more information. I really want to get this out and uh, want people to understand what sleep nose endoscopy is and how it helps people with obstructive sleep apnea and snoring.